You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome, welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Richard Brennan and I, Niels Castle Larsen, where each week we take the polls of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, before we dive into today's topics, I want to let you know that I will try to make our Systematic Investor Series a bit more focused on providing unique value to you as a listener. And this comes as a result of some feedback I had this week from one of our loyal listeners. What it means in practice is that I will move my macro-oriented weekly update to my weekly email update that comes out every Sunday. So the podcast episode will be more focused and potentially a bit shorter in time. Now, I'm going to do this on relatively short notice. um, So just bear with me as I find my feet with this new format. And of course, for those of you who'd like to get the short macro update plus other relevant content each week, and for some reason are not signed up yet to my Sunday email update, you just need to head over to toptradersonplug.com forward slash TTU dash news. Okay, with that housekeeping out of the way, let me say hi to you, Rich. It's uh, great to be back with you this week. How are you doing? What's happening down under? Oh, all good news. I'm getting a bit colder down here, but... uh... Uh, the markets, yeah, they've they've been an interesting sort of um, state uh, for the last few months. It's fairly flat for me, but uh, we've had some wiggles, ups and downs. But uh, yeah, uh, nothing to complain about. But uh, I certainly haven't experienced the fantastic trends of 2022 yet. But uh, all systems are patiently waiting, ready to fire um, if that event occurs. So uh, let's see what happens. Exactly. And I actually think we're going to touch on that uh, specific topic today. You know, the being patient and waiting to strike uh, is is one of the things that I have a feeling you will be talking about today. You're right. It hasn't been a super busy period either. Although I will say today, and I appreciate your flexibility, it is a bit of a busy day for me because uh, my father turns 90. So we're going to be celebrating him today. Um, and uh, he's been a very big uh, part uh, in my life and inspiration. So I definitely going to Uh, enjoy uh, celebrating him and his achievements. Now, from a trend following point of view, you did mention that not a lot had happened, Rich. Although when I look at it, uh, it seems like we've shifted this week uh, from a few weeks of commodity market leadership, uh, really back to financials being um, kind of where the action has Uh, We saw Japanese equity markets leading the way, I think, from a trend-following performance point of view. But also some of the other uh, equity markets in Europe did pretty well, uh, albeit, of course, the U.S. uh, was pretty flat on the week. Um, I think for long-term managers or systems, I think fixed income also enjoyed a pretty good week this week um, as we had rising yields across the world. And that obviously will benefit those who have kept their short exposure. Although I will say probably where you are in Australia and Japanese markets uh, may have performed a little bit differently. And elsewhere in the uh, trend following world, I would say energies probably did not help this week as prices rose. And since they have come down for quite a time, a, a while, uh, I think long most trend followers will be short at this time. And also maybe some of the softs uh, didn't do so well. However, we also had some pretty uh, decent uh, developments in grains, uh, meats, and the one market that never really helps us, cocoa. <laughs> so anyways, my trend barometer, um, I think is it's still stuck in neutral at 43. So uh, completely confirms what you've said, uh, Rich, early on, that not a lot has happened so far this year. Uh, from a performance point of view, we are sort of slowly making our way back to, uh, to flat for the year. Uh, the beta 50 index is up about 12 basis points so far this month, down 2% for the year. Sukgen CTA index up 67 basis points, down about 2.6% for the year. The trend index up about 1%, down 3.7% for the year. And the short-term traders index actually down 1.2% for the month so far uh, and down 3.3% um, so far this year. So that's probably the disappointing part of the uh, of the space right now equities uh yeah generally uh, up a little bit this week and of course still up for the for the year and bonds um trading down about a percent so far this month if you look at the 
uh, World Government Bond Index. Now, before we jump into your topics, Rich, uh, we got one question that uh, we'll quickly uh, talk about. Uh, it's from Zach. Uh, Zach says, I discovered your podcast a few months ago and have been devouring your pot- your past episodes. I love all the content. Well, that's very kind of you to say, uh, Zach. I have a question for you and your guest host on Systematic Investors. I've been running what I consider a trend-following system. I trade using a moving average system. Everything is programmed, and I trade across 30 stocks and 18 futures markets. I use a much shorter time frame than your guest, though. I trade using 30-minute data. My holding period range from 30 minutes to a few days, depending on the sustainability of the trend. My backtest includes execution cost, uh, corresponding to live trading expenses. I use the same signal for all markets going long and short. My question is whether you or your guest hosts have explored the viability of systems like this. I know it would not work uh, with scalability of large firms, um, but has there been any research you know that explore these shorter term time periods? Rich, any thoughts on this for Zach? Yeah, look, I I have done a a lot of research in the short-term space simply because, you know, ideally, yes, I would love some models that uh, gave me significant sort of diversification for my uh, my portfolio. I trade in the medium to long term. But what I've tended to find is that uh, the more you go down into the short-term space, the more you need to... um, add additional variables to your model. So um, the way I tend to view it is that um, out in the medium to long term space, my models are, are, are very simple in nature and capable of attacking many different forms of variation of trend. But um, as I um, start adding variables, um, more prescriptively defining those models, um, they they tend to be optimised for a particular class of trends. So the way I tend to view things is that I tend to um, accept that trends occur in all time frames, um, but uh, the nature of trend differs depending on where you're looking for it. So um, uh, I notice uh, in, in your podcast, Niels, with, with Jim, he's continually talking about secular and cy- cyclical um, trends. <laughs> That's the way I tend to view trends in my world in that um, there is a, a secular directional movement and then there's often cyclical directional movement. So if you can imagine a, a significant outlier such as London sugar or um, you know, orange juice or whatever that we've experienced recently, uh, the, the secular direction might have been valid for about three years. But when you look at the, the, the form of the trend, it has a lot of these little cyclical call undershoots and overshoots as you're going through the trend. So for a a short-term trader, those cyclical overshoots and undershoots are all forms of trend, but they differ in that they have a, a, a finite lifespan. They're determined by the cycle itself. So if you can imagine, um, if I wanted a trading model to attack that particular form of trend, I'd probably put a profit target on those trends because I recognise that uh, the nature of those cycles tends to oscillate around an equilibrium or the equilibrium of that that um, that secular trend, if you like. So it oscillates up and down as the secular trend goes forward. So I'd be putting profit targets in those models and I'd be putting other different momentum characteristics into those models to capture that particular class of trend. But um, this is where I think I'm changing the nature of my systems, which are specifically deployed to catch these outliers, and investing in this more highly optimised form of trend. Now, I don't like doing that because with my finite capital, that means I'm allocating some of that finite capital away from my secular simple trends, and I'm investing it in these alternate, um, more optimised models. And I find that that's not ideal from my perspective, how I want to allocate my capital. I want to allocate all of my effort and investment towards the outliers, 
So I recognise that opportunities do exist in the short-term time frame, and I recognise that there are obviously very successful trend followers who, who can operate in that short term, but their models are necessarily different. They're not universal models, simple models. They're specific models. They're, they're what I'd class as momentum models as opposed to trend-following models, because the way I look at it is that I class a trend-following model as having much more, here we go again, looser pants um, in its ability to capture a variety of different forms of trend, but I regard these more highly optimised models with maybe profit targets, the ability to extract over a short-term time frame a momentum move. I regard them more as momentum models. Um, does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, it, it's an interesting discussion because um i mean i'm assuming uh when i when i hear sax question that he's actually could well be doing what i would consider trend following um but on a shorter term time space and what i mean by that is i think you're absolutely right rich that a lot of the shorter term managers that we think about and that actually some of them just were featured on the uh, on this in the cta mini series that uh, that i've been doing with alan um that they're not really trend followers. They are using different ways of getting out. It could be time-based uh, stops. It could be profit targets because what they really want is to, um, you know, they want to exploit the expansion of momentum that doesn't last for more than a few days or a few hours. So I consider it slightly different. I consider it just as being short-term trading, not necessarily short-term trend following. So I think you're right in that. Um but I will warn you, Rich, <laughs> that on Monday we're going to release an episode with an ex-turtle that actually have found ways, and I think, you know, seems pretty successfully, of not just letting the winners run indefinitely, so to speak. So it's a quite an interesting, I won't reveal more than that. I'm sure you're going to be tuning in on Monday when you, uh, <laughs> as you, as you wake up. Um, but it was a, uh, it was one of those conversations where we afterwards talked about whether we should be a little bit concerned that certain other turtles might be having a hard time on their treadmill, uh, as they listen to, uh, as they listen to the conversation. Um, but it's fascinating. And, uh, and so, uh, look forward to, to publishing that in, in a couple of days. Um, anyways, I'm looking I hope, forward to that news. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, I hope uh, Zach that you got some uh, benefit from that. And actually, Zach, just go and listen to uh, a couple of the um, managers we just featured: uh, Crable and Quest. A uh, couple springs to mind. Uh, they're certainly much more in 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 your uh, space uh, than um, some of the other trend followers. But anyways, uh, Rich, last time you were on the show, we talked about uh, how much improvement adding a trend follower uh, to a traditional portfolio can um, improve the risk-adjusted returns, which, by the way, was not insignificant. And we also touched on some of the observations between the SuckGen CTA index and those ETFs that try to replicate the performance and if there was a little bit of a decoupling happening at the moment. And today we're going to take it a little bit further because we're going to kick things off with how we think, or should I say, yeah, how we think about manager selection and some of the processes behind manager selection that we have written about on the TTU uh, blog in the past. Uh, so this is very exciting, I think, because I think many investors looking to invest in this uh, area of the uh, financial world um, may not know exactly how to create a portfolio of managers. So why don't you kick it off and uh, I'll try to keep up as best I can and uh, maybe interject a few things along the way. Okay, Niels. So what this topic um, is going to be discussing is if, for instance, we have to make a choice in selecting a small um, section of managers from a wider selection of managers, how do we avoid um, uh, this, this um, selection bias that typically occurs when we have to make a choice between different managers? So just to put this into context, um, in our, our TTU um, monthly uh, report that we do for the trend following managers, we have a section there which is looking at um, how to select 
10 managers from a total selection of about 50 of um, the Top Traders Unplugged trend followers that we follow in our programs. Um, characteristic to all of the 50 or 57 trend following programs is that they must have a, a 15 year or 20 year um, validated track record. The longer the better, because we're using the validated track record as a basis to say, hey, look, without the benefit of a back test, um, the validated track record is uh, the best way to assess um, uh, robust candidates um, going forward into the future, because um, <clears throat> as everyone is aware, <clears throat> when they undertake a back test, um, they're using the benefit of hindsight because um, they're, ex um, they're exploiting um, the historical data to identify what is the optimal selection of strategies that they can derive from that historical data. And we know that that historical data um, paints a, a single history um, and we know that that is just one possible history based on the conditional events. Um, but um, because a uh, someone doing a back test is um, developing their models based on that single history that goes back 15, 20 years, um, they come up with a solution that um, is this fantastic back test. And they find that when they apply that back test going forward into an uncertain future, um, the performance significantly deteriorates, often falling off the cliff as soon as they go into the live environment. Now, the reality of this is that uh, the backtest process encourages selection bias. Now, I just want to explain what I mean by that. So if we have the task of choosing 10 managers from a selection of 50 managers, um, when do you know, Niels, how many possible permutations there are of 10 managers from a selection of 50 managers? Well, if I was going to guess, Rich... My guess would be ten billion two hundred and seventy two million two hundred and seventy eight and a hundred and seventy. Am I close? Well, I think you've, you might have seen my notes here, Neil. Uh, but but that is exactly right. So yes. let, let's look at it. So if if we're making a selection of fifty managers from a total number of fifty managers, there's one permutation. Uh, if we select 49 managers from 50 possible candidates, there are 50 possible permutations. So as we decrease the selection to a narrower number, the permutations explode in number. And when we are selecting 10 managers from 50 possible candidates, Niels, and I'm amazed at your ability to determine with exactness um, the number of permutations, but you're right, there is 10 billion um, possible outcomes. Uh, from this selection. So if you can imagine for someone who is an allocator placed in that situation of saying, what is the 10 best optimal outcomes from that selection of 50? You can see that they've got a massive task ahead of them, which is well beyond their brain's capacity to deal with. And they'll need a computer to actually thoroughly investigate um, these outcomes. So what I'm talking about here is that we can't use single correlation statistics when we are compiling portfolios of, of say, 10 uh, managers, we need to use the entire uh, validated track record of each of those managers so that collectively, when we undertake that examination of how they all work together as a compilation, uh, what is the optimal outcome? So um, we can't take, for instance, individual correlation statistics there. We've got to take their entire track record. And the way we do that is an iteration process where we are we are collating bundles of 10 uh, from a possible selection of 50, and then we are evaluating how those 10 that we've selected, and there are 10 billion of them, of those possible selections, how they as a composite um, produce an optimal risk-adjusted return. So um, this is where we need the power of computers to avoid this propensity for us to apply selection bias in our process, because it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. When there is one optimal solution in that 10 billion um, sequence of permutations, you see that uh, it is like a, a needle in a haystack and we need a, a powerful computer-based process to actually confirm that the solution that we select is the optimal candidate. 
So we fortunately have computers, Niels, and this is what I do on our monthly um, uh, blog post where um, I'm looking at a selection of 10 managers from a composite of 50 managers that we have in the TTU index. And then um, I'm using this iteration process to come up with the optimal solution. Now, there is no question that it's the optimal solution. It is the optimal solution. There is one solution in there that is better than all the others, but it requires us to be able to um, map out um, how those um, those collections of 10 all relate together and what is their optimal risk-adjusted return. So when I do that on the computer, I come up with a fantastic equity curve of the top 10, um, which I'll just uh, explain the, the overall performance characteristics using um, data from 2000 up to the current day. So we've got the monthly data from Nielsen Hedge, and then I compile this process. So the top 10 uh, produce a compound annual growth rate of 9.8% with a maximum drawdown of 12.6%. That is the optimal solution from selecting 10 from that available 50. But as I said before, that's using the benefit of hindsight bias because we have the monthly histories behind us. Now, and the process needed to obtain that optimal solution is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So is there a process, therefore, that we can apply to converge towards that optimal solution without the benefit of hindsight? And um, there is a, a process we can apply. And effectively, it's, um, it's very much like a walk forward process. You might have heard that term walk forward technique. The basis of a walk forward technique is you evaluate a performance result. Say we under let let's say that um, if we undertook a process at this current day to come up with what are those optimal ten candidates, we've already told you. Uh, after these ten billion iterations, we come up with a solution that produces a compound annual growth rate of nine point eight percent and a maximum drawdown of twelve point six percent, or a uh, a Ma ratio of 0.7. That, that's the best we can get from that selection of 57 candidates with a 15-year track record. Let's imagine, therefore, that um, we go back to the year um, uh, 2000 and we undertake this process at that time. So, therefore, we're looking back in time, back to 1980, and we are evaluating what managers were present at that particular point in time. And we're undertaking that exact iteration process that I've explained before, the 10 billion iterations, say, of 50 managers to come up with what is the optimal in uh, the year 2000. I come up with a result. Now, what I do is that is a hindsight result. So uh, what I therefore do is I run with those 10 managers for the, uh, the, the, the first 12 months until uh, the year 2001. So I'm selecting those 10 candidates back in the year 2000 who produce that optimal return, and then we run to um, using those 10 selections to 2001. So just to go back in time, uh, the managers that I chose back there, uh, uh, you, you, there's a lot you'll be familiar with, Niels, because Dunn was one of them, Chesapeake was another one, Eckhart was another one. These were managers that, that fell into that grouping of 10 back in 2000 uh, based on their performance track record, and I selected those 10 and ran with them for 2001. Then, at the end of 12 months, I undertook the process again, but this time using an additional year's worth of data. So now we've got, say, 21 years of data, and I run that iteration process again, the 10 billion iterations, looking at the, the best 10, and you might find that the selection slightly changes, or it might stay fairly consistent. It all depends on the track record performance adding that additional year. Now, if you can imagine, that is a walk forward process because we're each year we're using an unseen data for a year based on a, a track record that's evaluated uh, 12 months earlier. So as we're, we're stepping through this process, undertaking this process each year, but we're selecting our managers for the future year, which is unseen. And as we step through this process, you'll see that that, that process actually converges to that optimal outcome at the current day.
because when we undertake the process now and we evaluate what is the best the selection of 10 from 10 billion, uh, we find that uh, the results today are now incorporating all of that history plus all of the, the more recent history and it comes up with a selection uh, and it produces that optimal outcome that I explained to you earlier. Um, it was the, the compound annual growth rate of, uh, uh, what was it, uh, nine, uh, back, back then it was, uh, so the result of that was a compound annual growth rate of, uh, I think it was 8.8 .8 and 12.6% drawdown. Now, so when um, I undertake this process and then um, we summate um, the results to produce an equity curve, we find that it is very close to that optimal solution because it is converging towards that optimal solution. Now, it's always going to be lagging by 12 months because of the nature of the process we undertake. We're, we're evaluating based on a, tr a prior track record and then we're rolling forward on unseen data 12 months. But what this process does is it converges towards that optimal solution. So. This is a selection process that therefore avoids any form of, um, of timing selection. It's a process that we can apply and it has wider application than just this um, process I'm describing here to select a, a possible fund of fund structure because I apply a similar process in my workflow process that I do for my trend following models. But what it's doing is it's embedding a degree of adaption into those models. It's recognising that um, these complex adaptive systems called markets inherently have this um, ability to ensure that um, any selection process we do must have an element of adaptivity in it to recognise that um, markets are never stationary in nature. They're complex systems, they're non-stationary. Performance changes over time. Your selection process, therefore, needs to change over time. And it's not something, um, you know, um, if we undertook a selection process using available data today, or we undertook a back test using available data today, we're going to get this super splendid result, but it has no persistence going forward. This is a process, uh, an alternative process that avoids that and it incorporates this degree of adaptability in it. And I think it's a very powerful method that can be deployed for anyone um, who is in the game of allocation or um, it's a very powerful method for people developing their trend following models as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and what I love about uh, this is the fact that as you, as you when you start breaking it down the way you do, Rich, is that it actually takes a lot of the um, difficulties out of it. I mean, I know the process requires some work and some skills, but it's not, uh, it's something that can be overcome. And, and once you have it, um, I mean, you have to run it once a year. It's not something that, uh, you know, will take too much time for people. And as you say, yeah, sure, it's never going to be as good as a complete hindsight methodology, of course, but it's pretty close and it certainly has the same, yeah, a little bit lower return, but also lower drawdowns and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I really, uh, I really like it. I think it's, it's very, uh, it's very powerful. I mean, the, the, because the funny part is that I guess it's like with anything in investments, people spend so much time on essentially forecasting the future. Where should I invest or how should I invest? And they make it sound like it's, uh, you know, it's an all, it's almost like, you know, predicting, uh, you know, a, 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 an unknown future. But I think you're taking the prediction part out of this by applying this process, and like we do with trend following in general. And I think that's what really makes it a, a very powerful methodology. Actually, Neil, there's one point I forgot. So uh, I'd like to report the results we got at the end of this process, just to compare and contrast against that optimal result that we achieved versus what the process came to. So um, the optimal process, as you remember, had a compound annual growth rate of 8.83%. By adopting this process of walk forward over the last uh, 22 years, effectively we achieve a compound annual growth rate of 7.05%. Fairly similar to 8.83, but yes, slightly worse. Um, but the drawdowns, interestingly, the drawdowns of the optimal selection was 12.63, so that's a 
compound annual growth rate of 8.83 and a drawdown of 12.63. But our drawdown of our process is 11.54. So on a risk-adjusted basis, when we compare and contrast, we've got a MA ratio of 0.7 for the optimal um, selection using hindsight bias, and we've got a MA ratio of 0.61 without hindsight bias. So Yes, it's lower, and it will always be lower. You'll never be able to, whenever you do a back test, whenever you do uh, uh, something using selection bias, you're always going to achieve a, a better result than what is practically possible through actual live implementation. And this, this is why also the validated track record of a, of a fund manager is so critically important rather than using statistical metrics from a back test, uh, the validated track record of a manager is from a manager who is staring into the void of uncertainty. They don't know what's going to happen next year, which is different to a back test, which has got all of that data laid out in front of them. So, uh, you know, the, the validated track record is so important because it talks about the skills of the manager, the discipline of the manager, how they're able to uh, robustly stick to their strategy, disciplined at all times, what they do in extreme events to manage their risk. These things are, are never sort of uh, uh, identified through your back test process. And this is why I, I do love the validated track record as opposed to a back test result or, or something in hindsight that we can go back to assess. Now, one thing I was noticing um, from our latest uh, monthly report was um, that this methodology, uh, if I'm reading the numbers correctly, actually produces a, a better return and risk-adjusted return um, compared to the serenity ratio methodology that we're also looking at. Because I think you and I fell in love with the serenity ratio as a concept. We thought that would make sense. It it takes into account the path dependency of the risks and, and so on and so forth. And although it is picking, I don't know if it's picking because we're only using five names, maybe there is some more variability. That's right. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah, that probably is yeah. the difference. Yeah. I think uh, uh, with the serenity ratio method that we adopted, we only adopted uh, a selection of five managers. This is a selection of 10 managers. And it's interesting, as you add more and more managers, you get a better result. Now, this is diversification in action because when I compare the equity curve of uh, this process, uh, which produces this this very good result of, uh, you know, 7.05% um, CAGR against an 11.5% drawdown. When I compare that to the TTU index, which is a composite of all of those managers, we find that the TTU index outperforms all of them. Now, if we had infinite capital, that would be saying, yes, invest in the entire constituents of the TTU index. But when you've got finite capital, you've got to make a selection process. You've got to uh, reduce your ability to achieve that maximum outcome from maximum diversification. So, uh, but this is a very powerful process to ensure that um, you, you know you you have a very strong performance record with what is available uh, in that selection process. So it might not be the ideal one. The ideal one might be invest in the index, but you'll need infinite capital or close to infinite capital to achieve that. But by selecting 10 managers, uh, that gives you, uh, that, that uh, reduces the degree of manager risk uh, by selecting a, an ensemble of managers. And um, it also gives you the benefit of all of those correlation impacts of those 10 managers. Um, and the benefits uh, are expressed in the, the overall um, return stream by virtue of the fact that all of these managers are robust. So we're selecting from robust candidates and uh, the correlation benefits of putting them all together produces this superior overall result as an ensemble without having to get into the, the problems of selection bias and all of these things. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Maybe we need to ask our, our mutual friend, Andrew, um, to launch an ETF based on the TTU index. That might be a hit with some people. All right. Well, this was uh, this was a great way to kick off um, our topics today, Rich. The next one um, is, you know, in, in, to some extent, it, it touches on something that we've talked about many times, namely, you know, what's the best way of hunting uh, these trends? But as usual, you always come up with a very 
visual and um, easy to understand uh, way, which is uh, obviously uh, a sign of being a great uh, educator as you are. So um, should we jump into the world of cheetahs and spiders and see what happens? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we go. So I, I love using analogies because uh, often when we're dealing with data and price data, things are pretty dry. But um, when you look at alternative complex systems and you look at um, you know what happens in those alternative com complex systems, you often find very strong analogies that have uh, um, you know that resonate with with what we're doing. And um, I, I tend to think that there are two forms in our quantitative um, circles of, of price action. So this is, this is talking about the quantitative um, the price manager as opposed to, say, the fundamental investor or whatever. Um, you're dealing with two forms of attack, two forms of hunting technique. One is a, uh, a applied to understanding the characteristics of a specific um, species or a specific market and the other is a generic universal form of attack uh, which um, is much less direct in in what it is specifically targeting and so i'm tending to think that there are two forms of of price hunter in our quantitative circles one called the cheetah and one called the spider so to understand how the analogy um, is based um I'm saying that an outlier hunter, such as me, um, you know, I tend to class myself as um, hunting for these outliers. I'm looking for a universal or generic feature that is present across any liquid market. This method of hunting, therefore, um, is a generic form of hunting. It's not specifically targeting a particular price feature. It's targeting a universal principle. But other forms of, of um, quantitative um, data managers are exploiting particular patterns in the data. They're specific to identifying what, uh, what are the characteristic patterns in that data on the basis that um, if there is a sufficient sample size of those exploitable patterns recognised through their, their backtesting process or their, their, their data analysis process, that those, those, um, those patterns have some causal relationship with the way future price unfolds. And therefore, uh, when we're looking into an uncertain future, um, if these uh, repeating causal patterns arise, there is a high probability that that means that price will unfold in a particular way. So that is a different form of hunter. That is the cheater. Uh, that is that is someone who is um, so a cheater when it is examining its herd that it's going to be um, exploiting arbitrage from. It's sitting there on the savanna um, in the grass, looking at the herd and identifying um, particular characteristics in that market that look at an exploitable opportunity. So they're looking for the the, the small game. That the young game, the weak game, the incapacitated game, incapacitated game. They're looking at them to see, um, uh, evaluate their exploitable opportunities. And when it identifies its target, it then uses its blistering speed to, and a direct line of attack to hunt down that prey because it's looking at how it can use its optimized capabilities, which is its speed and its agility to, um, at, with a direct line of attack, mow down its prey and catch its prey. Now, to the unsuspecting game out there, um, typically when they're being attacked, they um, if they're not experienced in this game of attack, they'll adopt this, this, this flight tendency where they'll suddenly scurry off in a particular direction, um, usually in a straight line, and the cheetah with its particular optimised characteristics hunts down that 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 prey so i'm i'm referring to them this form of attack as as chasing price chasing price a cheetah chasing price so um for those people that are exploiting um opportunities with these repeating patterns in the market they are chasing that feature chasing that price feature that's the analogy there but um with uh, an outlier hunter they're much like more like a, a spider. They use a different form of attack mechanism. They're not um, individually assessing the capabilities of the herd uh, or, or whatever they're attacking. What they're doing is they're saying, 
Let's look at the overall mechanics of the herd or the flock, whatever they're targeting, and they're looking at the general tendencies or the universal characteristics of that herd. They'll notice that the herd might walk or, or graze in a particular corridor, uh, but there'll be certain um, numbers of that herd that, that tend to sort of verge towards the, the um, extremes of that corridor. There'll be particular, um, you know, when they're not under threat, um, they will tend to sort of lazily graze or lazily move away from the general characteristics of the overall herd, and they'll see that that is an exploitable opportunity. And the way they'll target that opportunity is the establishment of ambush points or, or traps, as opposed to a direct line of attack on those herds. So they'll understand the overall mechanic characteristics of the herd, the universal qualities of that herd, and then they'll notice that there are certain universal features of that herd. There'll be certain strays that, that uh, uh, are in the distal regions of the corridor that tend to sort of eat out in those zones. So they'll identify these perfect points to lay their ambushes or their, their traps. So as an outlier hunter, that's the way I view my attack mechanism. So what I'll do is I say, I'll examine price data and I'll see that uh, when I look at the um, distribution of returns of any liquid market, I notice that, here we go again, Niels, they all have this leptokurtic tendency. Now, I know we always have a laugh when we bring up leptokurtic, but I think it's got to be in at least each time, once per episode, we've got to mention that term. <laughs> But we'll notice that uh, when we evaluate any liquid market data over a sufficient data sample, there is this leptokurtic tendency. There are these tails that occur, which are e extremes away from um, the mean of the distribution and the bulk of the distribution. The bulk of the distribution or the herd itself, there are these extreme events that occur on the distal regions. So for the ambush layer or the trap layer, they are placing their traps at specific locales that are capitalising on these tail regions of that overall mechanics, the universal features of those mechanics. And the prey that they catch, well, they've, they've got no choice um, in, in selecting the weakest or strongest or whatever. They've got to have fairly robust traps to capture as much as they possibly can. It might be a big beast that wanders out into the, at, at the distal areas of that tail region. But what they'll find is that uh, the game is a totally different game to the game the cheetah plays. The cheetah is able to exploit with their cunning and their optimised abilities, but the ambush layer, it's a game of patience and a game of waiting. So the difference is that a, a, an attack mechanism that is looking to exploit a, a repeating feature in the market never finds they're in drawdown because they're, they're capitalising on that repeating feature and while their systems are working, they're never in drawdown. But someone who is adopting an ambush technique or, or a, a predatory um, sort of um, a spider web technique, they find that they are persistently in drawdown because it's a game of waiting. So um, the difference being that um, a trend follower like myself, an outlier hunter, um, my performance is characterised by almost persistent drawdowns um, over the course of time. It's, it's a characteristic that I need to endure because it is a game of waiting and a game of patience. But then I'll get this explosion where suddenly, uh, without me being able to predict when or where that occurs, I suddenly find that I've got all of this prey being collected in my traps, my ambush zones. Um, this is different to the cheetah, who is specific in, in hunting down a, a particular beast or an animal that knows its size, it's a weak, weak animal or whatever. It's, exp it's nibbling at small elements of that herd, but the outlier hunter um, often finds that um, without warning, they're capturing large gains, windfalls, things that are much greater than themselves. So for the poor little spider with their webs, they suddenly find that they might have birds in their webs, things that are much larger than themselves, but it's a windfall that keeps them going for such a long period of time. So this is sort of the analogy I use in these two different methods of hunting. I, I think it's useful because um, it helps to explain 
the core differences between the different philosophies and the approach. Um, but one is a game of patience and wait. It's a totally different game. And when you're applying a totally different game, you're applying totally different metrics, performance assessments, all of these different things are totally different to the other game that um, probably most traders um, adopt. So uh, when we look at um, who is the cheater and who is a spider uh, in this game of trading the financial markets? We find that there are a few, um, far less spiders, maybe 5%, 10% spiders than there are cheaters. Most people are, are 90% because they like to think that uh, uh, using their, their cunning, their abilities, their optimised processes, um, that they have the ability to, to control um, how how they obtain their wealth in the market, uh, but for the spider, they're much less. They're much more humble creatures, recognizing they can't control the market. But by setting these these traps in these very strategic locations, uh, they wait for the market to feed them. If that makes sense. <laughs> no, no, it, it 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 does make perfect sense. And just on the, on the same similar sort of topic, I was listening to uh, someone uh, on a YouTube video this week. And he was talking about that, you know, how he uses, not why he uses trend following techniques. He's not a, he's not a CTA, but he uses trend following techniques. And, and this is something that is so simple to understand. And which is why you would think, well, why wouldn't everybody use trend following techniques? And, and what he was basically arguing was to say, well, if you, if you believe that a price of say a stock is going to move from $10 to 50 well, what's the one thing you can be 100% sure of is the fact that it has to go th through 11, right? So it has to move higher. And so th this is where some of these price-based techniques, instead of forecasting based on balance sheets and cash flows and, and what have you, but if you just think of it as, well, this is a very, very simple statement, but it's also a very, very true statement, that if you believe a stock is going from $10 to 50 it has to move through 11. And if that's your entry point to trigger that breakout, well, then that's uh, obviously a trend following type technique. So I love then you, um, when you go into these analogies and so on and so forth, since as you already discovered, Rich, that I had actually been paying attention to your notes earlier in our conversation today, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that I don't know uh, when you want to bring up or, or, or whether you want to bring them up, but I know in your notes you talked about something called the Knowledge Project. Um, so I don't know if that is part of this particular topic or whether that's for another uh, topic. So I'll I'll leave that with you. Yeah, no, uh, the, the Knowledge Project, um, it, it's a podcast by Shane Parrish and uh, – uh, the, I was listening to it this week, and um, the, the, I think it was a, a you know a few weeks ago that the podcast was released. But it was interviewing a gentleman from the Boston Consolidating Group, and uh, it was a very interesting pro uh, podcast because once again the analogy started flying f fast and thick, and I started uh, comparing and contrast c contrasting what he was talking about to our process as outlier hunters, and. Uh, what what uh, the podcast did, about half of the podcast was devoted towards the difference between private companies and public com companies, so uh, private family-owned companies and public-listed companies. And uh, what we find, uh, what, what uh, the, the gentleman from Boston Consulting Group was talking about is that um, there are two different uh, philosophies applied to a, a private family company versus a public company. Um, the public company typically um, has investors that are investing in that public company, and the investors have immediate demands. Um, the, the, the focus on the public company is very much towards short-term success. It's towards... Um, effectively demanding that the public company optimise their processes towards achieving short-term successful outcomes. Um, so uh, the, the private family company, however, has a totally different agenda. Their agenda is preservation for the future. So they're looking at um, the legacy of passing that family company over to their, their children, their offspring. And so they're looking at a very much longer-term time frame in relation to the um, 
the how they um, apply the, the finite resources of the, that company towards those ambitions. So when I was talking about the cheetah and the spider, um, the difference between the cheetah and the spider is that the cheetah is highly optimised to achieve this chasing down of this, this pattern. And um, it's a very successful technique, uh, provided that conditions remain the same in the future. Provided that those patterns persist in the future, it is a very successful t technique. But it is very short-term in nature because we know that the nature of these markets are non-stationary in nature and conditions do change. And the conditions that are responsible for particular price patterns are often what I call multivariate conditional variables. So it's not a single variable. It's how the interplay of all of these conditional variables occur that create this this sense of stability and endurance. But we recognise that if any of those variables, those conditional variables, do slightly change, there is a massive disruption to that price pattern. So this means that um, the, the cheetah, uh, the method of attack, the direct line of attack, um, the, the, the resources involved in adopting that attack are, are highly sort of focused towards optimising towards a particular pattern just like uh, a public company optimises their resources to achieve investor satisfaction in the short term. So um, the decisions that they make with their, their the public company's finite resources are usually, uh, you know, what is the best thing to do to achieve an optimal outcome uh, immediately? And so uh, the compensation given to the uh, managers of that public company is often tied to immediate rewards, immediate events. It's very often not related to long-term success of that company, shareholder bonuses, all of these things are directed towards immediate gratification of investor needs. Everything, the resources of the entire company are shifted towards a highly optimised response. Now, what this gentleman from Boston Consolidating Group recognised is that in this process of optimising through um, resource allocation, um, it makes it specific to fit a particular function. So it's, it's very precise in its ability to attack a single um, opportunity. But as you progressively allocate your resource towards a specific purpose, you become more fragile in the ability of that company to respond to alternate events that lie outside the scope of that particular purpose. And so inevitably, when there is a degree of optimization in any process, it becomes what you call fit to function, but it becomes much more fragile. So for the, the, um, the private company, the family company, they recognise this. So often what they do is they, they delay the immediate um, um, allocation of resources to particular um, short-term goals, um, and they, 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 they keep wealth assigned for the long-term future. Um, they have a different uh, way of allocating their resources. So they're not looking at immediate gratification. Often they're sacrificing the immediate short-term goals for the benefit of the long-term goals. Goals. And this is the way I view a, an outlier hunter or a trend follower like ourselves who are patient waiting for this opportunity. This is how I view a, a similar process. We are not optimising our systems to achieve an immediate um, goal or ambition because we recognise that um, markets over the course of change, uh, the course of time do change. They're non-stationary in nature. We've got a different process where we're, we're, we're holding a lot of our capital back effectively on the basis that we are preserving our capital um, because um, with these, um, these non-predictive anomalies that uh, we know exist, um, in the market, but we have no recognition of the timing of when they occur or where they occur. We need a different process that is is not optimising to um, uh, our process towards an ambition of of um, getting these outliers, but it's a, a patient waiting game, waiting for these opportunities to arise. We're protecting capital at all time, but we have systems that are capable, loose pants systems that are capable of exploiting those opportunities when they do arise. So that was another analogy. And, and I suppose a, a further analogy is when you look at, um, you know, uh, Formula One racing. Um, you know, an example is, um, you know, you, you, uh, when you look at Formula One racing, you notice that the conditions of that racing event, the track, 
everything about that is well well known it is very stable there is a uh, we know where the, the curves are in the track we know the, the smooth nature of the road we know know all of these conditions in advance and therefore we can um, allocate resources to refining the engines refining the f1 to be the fastest possible way of getting around that track because we know that those conditions are very stable but the fragility emerges because we also say if we if we see any change in those conditions of the track for instance a pile up on one particular corner or suddenly a rain event uh, causing the track to become slippery suddenly we get this massive disruption to that um, that stationary nature of that track and suddenly all of the the optimized responses that have been done to the f1 reveals itself as risk events in those areas because it certainly doesn't express the sort of the robust capabilities of of say the, the four-wheel drive or these other other sort of slower vehicles that are more generic in their ability to handle a much broader array of different conditional events um, suddenly we find that um, this fragility emerges when the conditions um, of that track slightly change, only a very small um, change at all. So that, that's another analogy that it's talking about this continual fight um, towards optimization versus fragility. There, um, there is a sacrifice going on when you optimize a process, invest your resources towards one particular opportunity. You are, you are making yourself less able to cut, to cope with risk events when those conditions slightly change. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Rich, this was uh, amazing. I think we'll keep the rest of the topics for um, another day. Uh, as mentioned, it's a little bit of a busy day for me as I have to go and pay tribute and celebrate my father in a few hours. Um, but this was uh, awesome, as usual. And uh, yeah, if you love this new format, although today was, uh, you know, a little bit of a of a hybrid, um, but I will try to make it even more focused on the topic of systematic investing and then leave out the macro stuff uh, for my uh, Sunday emails, which you can sign up to over on the, uh, if you go to toptradersonplug.com forward slash TTU dash news. Next week, uh, Rob is back. Uh, so that will be your chance to have him tackle some of your questions. So feel free to uh, send them in uh, as usual. Info at toptradersonplug.com is where you will have to do that and uh, if you want to support uh, our efforts here um, please head over to itunes or amazon or spotify and leave a rating and review it certainly helps more people discover uh, our little podcast here with that said from rich and me thanks ever so much for listening we look forward to being back with you next week and until next time as usual take care of yourself and take care of each other Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.